Engine Performance 1 Test 6 should be in front of you right now. Um, engine Condition Diagnosis and Invisible Service. If you ever look at the task list for the NATEF things, Engine Performance and Engine Repair have got a lot of the same tasks. And so uh, that's, that's why you're seeing some of the same questions on engine performance that you would see on engine repair. Technician A says low oil pressure causes engine wear. Technician B says engine wear can cause low oil pressure. Okay. Both of them. Okay. Yeah, engine repair can cause low oil pressure and low oil pressure causes engine repair. You see that it, uh, how it can snowball? The following statements are all correct except, and the reason you do that is like I said, if you're wearing out bearings, you're making clearance where oil can squirt out of there when it's not supposed to, and the oil gets thin, it's thin as gasoline whenever it's running, you know, and it can just, and the oil pressure goes away when it, if it does not doesn't have a good tight place to go, you know. The following statements are all correct except A, oil pressure may be tested by removing the oil pressure sending unit and installing a pressure gauge. That's true. Recommended oil pressure is 1 PSI for every, ten, every 1,000 RPM. That's wrong. It's 10 PSI. The other two are right. Oil pressure testing should be done at normal operating temperature, and oil pressure reading should be done at idle in 2,500. Uh, technician A says if the oil pressure warning light is on, <coughs> oil pressure should be checked with a manual gauge. Just when you take the uh, sending unit out, screw a gauge in there, see what it actually is, right? Technician B says a faulty electrical circuit could cause oil pressure warning light to come on even when the oil pressure is good. That's right. Yep. Uh, and that's number three. Number four, which uh, the following could result in low engine compression. Damaged piston or piston ring. Damaged valve. Solar head gasket. All of these are correct. Uh, Amber and uh, Adam would remember having to pull the head off of that GMC out there, and it had blown a gasket between two cylinders, and it kept blowing compression back and forth between the two cylinders, so that made a divot in the head and the block and you know basically junk the engine because um, fixing that engine would cost a lot more than just jamming another one in it but that guy needs to I call that guy and say when are you going to come pick that thing up he goes they ain't pick that thing up yet you know he's acting like he's you know whatever um, and so anyway uh, let's see when preparing for a compression test technician A disables the ignition system uh, technician B only removes a spark plug for the cylinder he's testing which technician is correct this right here, will you do me a favor? Yeah. And will you like pass it along to her? Yeah. That's for me. Yeah. Because I'm very keen on yeah. guys dancing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <Hey. laughs> oh, what a sweetheart you are. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I put them in there in the little case, okay? Okay. Thanks. She brought you an extension. <laughs> she felt your pain. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. How many, uh, excuse me, number five, when preparing for a compression test, technician A disabled the ignition system. Technician B removed only the spark plug for the cylinder he's testing. Which technician is correct? Mm -hmm. You're supposed to pull them all out. And you're supposed to hold the accelerator pedal all the way to the floor, and you're supposed to disable the ignition system, and I would disable the fuel system too, because I don't want gas squirting in there while I'm doing my compression test, changing the readings when I hadn't gotten to those cylinders yet. So do everything you can to make sure that spark and gas are not there while you're spinning it over. They didn't even mention that here, see, but I don't want it squirting fuel in there because it's going to change it, right? Uh, yeah, uh, number five is going to be... Uh, Actually, it'll be A. You're going to pull all the plugs out, though. That's why the number, that's why B's wrong. Um, how many compression strokes should be used during a compression test? How many puffs are you looking for? One. No, you need about five or six, oh. basically. Uh, that's going to be uh, B. When performing a cylinder leakage test, the following statements are correct, except A, air escaping through the tailpipe may indicate an effective exhaust valve. That's correct. Shop air should be applied through the spark plug hole. Wow, what about that? Uh, bubbles in the coolant may indicate a defective head gasket or shop air should be applied to the dipstick tube. That's not a cylinder leakage test. What you can do if you want to apply uh, some air pressure to the dipstick tube, I wouldn't put shop air in there on the dipstick tube. I would put a, like 12, 15 pounds of pressure in the dipstick tube, cap off your PCV and your crankcase breather, put some air pressure in there and look for an oil leak. If it's a splash oil leak coming by a valve cover or an oil pan, you'll find it with air pressure in a crankcase. 
Most people don't ever think about that, but it works really well. You're scratching around trying to figure out where an oil leak is, put that air pressure in a crankcase, get your soap bubbles, you'll find it. Well, there it is right there. We we'll just do that in the fourth place all the time. Um, let's see. Uh, so number seven, you're, that should be a D. When performing a cylinder leakage test, technician A says 20% leakage is acceptable. Technician B says cylinder will show too much leakage if the piston is not at TDC on its compression stroke. Obviously, if you got valves open, you know, that's, both those guys are right. If you got valves open, you're not really good enough. That's why you got to be able to put it on top dead center compression. A cylinder power balance test is performed. Cylinders one, two, and three all drop 175 RPM when disabled with a scan tool. Cylinder four drops 50 RPM when disabled. The following statements are all correct except what? Cylinder four is much weaker than one, two, and three. Cylinder four is much stronger than one, two, and three. The test could also be conducted by grounding the plug wire for each cylinder. Has the state band been repaired? Uh, it actually has not, the air conditioner has not failed to work. Uh, if he needs it, he can take it. We're not, it does, it's not tied down. But uh, the air conditioner is, has been cooling really good and I can't get it to quit cooling. Okay. So uh, tell him he, if he needs it, that you'll bring it to him. Okay. All right. All right. But, um, but anyway, um, yeah, where are we going here? Nine. I lost, uh, number 10 was A. Uh, number nine is basically going to be uh, B, and ten being when you pull the spark plug wire from the plug while the engine running, it can damage ignition system components because it'll you know cause the high voltage spike that can scream back through there. If you ground a plug wire while the engine running, uh, could damage the engine components. You know that's A only. You're not going to damage it if you take your test light and you hook it to ground, and you don't and you're careful not to damage your plug wire. If you back probe the plug wires and short that signal out, you're not hurting anything that way, but you're killing the spark and you're finding out if that cylinder is making any difference. If you find one that's not making any difference, that's the one that's not contributing and that's where you're, what you're looking for. That's a power balance test. Normal engine vacuum at idle is what? Yep, go ahead, it's 17 to 21. Yeah. Let's back up to 11, which is not a step in the crank and vacuum test. Block the throttle wide open going to do that. You're not going to have any crank and vacuum if you do that, are you? Don't do that. Uh, it's going to be eight. Technician A says a low but steady idle vacuum reading indicates a sticking valve. No. Technician B says a fluctuating vacuum gauge reading indicates incorrect ignition timing. Which technician is correct about that? Uh, that's both of those are wrong. But if you if you got an engine that's running rough, what I used to do when I got one in there, they say this, we got a misfire and all that. One of the first things I would do when I was checking one out is I'd hook a vacuum gauge up to the intake manifold and if I see the vacuum needle bouncing, I know we got a valve problem. And it's time to, you know, figure out, see about going into it. Uh, I mean, you can fool with injectors and all this other kind of stuff, but if you got a valve that's not sealing, you know, you're wasting your time. Um, let's see, which of the following is not a cause of high back pressure? Restricted exhaust pipe, restricted catalytic converter, restricted muffler. Vacuum leak is not going to cause high back pressure. Now, who was I was working with on that one that we checked the catalytic converter? That's you, wasn't it? And we had five pounds of exhaust back pressure between the manifold and the catalyst. That doesn't sound like a lot, but it's too much. We pull the catalyst off, it's coming all to pieces, right? Uh, all right, so it's really important to understand all that. It's not too hard to do them tests usually, really. Um, Exhaust back pressure of an engine running at idle should be what? Less than one and a half PSI. We got five on that one, right? Torque specification for many intake manifolds are in what unit? Pound inches, inch pounds, 12 inch pounds to a foot. If it's, you know, 25 or let's say, you know, 24, it'd be what? Two foot pounds, right? 24 uh, inch pounds would be two foot pounds. When replacing a timing belt, many experts and vehicle manufacturers recommend that what other parts be replaced? Tensioner, water pump, camshaft oil seal. While you're there, now we don't typically put a camshaft oil seal on them. Uh, it's probably a good idea to do that on Toyota Camry if it's one of those with a belt like the 90s. Uh, hybrid electric vehicles usually require special engine oil of what viscosity? I think it's zero W20, yeah that's 18. All right. Technician A uses a steel gasket scraper on aluminum engine parts. Um, technician B uses a plastic or wood scraper. <laughs> you know you're supposed to use a plastic or a wood scraper on aluminum engine parts. Uh, I don't know of uh, hardly anybody I've ever seen that abides by that, but if you've got a good, uh, good sense about you, you'll be really gentle with aluminum engine parts. If you're using a bristle disc, make sure you're using a white one and don't overdo it even with that one. 
An intake manifold gasket has been replaced for a vacuum leak. The following steps use the scan tool. What do you use a scan tool to complete the job? Idle relearn, torquing the manifold bolts, refilling the cooling system, or air cleaner check? Idle relearn. Don't be the idle relearn, yeah. Um, vehicle has a, a diagnostic trouble code PO172, which means lean exhaust, and a vacuum leak is suspected. This can be diagnosed by doing what around the intake manifold gasket? Propane. Propane. Not rock salt would not be a good thing, neither would sprayed gasoline, neither would shop air. Some engines equipped with a timing belt. The belt may also drive what? Water pump. Water pump. Hybrid electric vehicle has a feature that can allow engine to start and run without warning. This feature is called idle stop. Some of the wiring under the hood of a late model vehicle is encased in bright orange. That, what does that mean? Uh, high, high voltage. Not, not high pressure. You don't have that pressure in the uh, Technician, well, uh, technically that would be high pressure, wouldn't it? Uh, technician A says to use high voltage linesman's gloves when servicing the high voltage system on hybrid electric vehicles. Technician B says remove the ignition key before service. Which technician is correct? That's C. Uh, when changing a timing belt, it's recommended that what also be replaced? Let's go ahead and throw a crankshaft seal in it. Most of the time we don't do that because it's not leaking, but you know, you can come up with anything you want to. What can be used to detect a vacuum leak at the intake manifold gasket? Spray water, dye, coolant, propane. Obviously propane, we've already been there. When torquing intake manifold bolts, what's the proper sequence? From the center to the outer ends. Well, yeah, yeah, from the center to the outer ends, that's why it basically is. And I'll tell you something else, with some of these uh, V engines that have aluminum intake manifolds on them, like V6s and these big wide, I don't know about these big wide uh, Japanese engines and all that kind of stuff, if you don't loosen those intake manifold bolts in the right sequence, it can warp the manifold and make it hard to get off of there. But it's really important to loosen them in the proper sequence. If it's one of those big wide V6s, you know, like a Duratec or whatever. Uh, so, let's see, before removing the timing belt, what should a technician do? align the timing mark. Uh, that's only valid if the timing belt's not stripped. If you're just replacing the timing belt like Harley was doing the other day, you line the timing marks up. Hey there, right, Harley. Mm -hmm. What's the proper tool used to measure valve clearances? Feeler gauge. Feeler gauge. We're going to move on to this other one here now. We got a little bit of time on that one. Uh, I had a story I was going to tell you a while ago, but I forgot what it was. Uh, which of the following could cause excessive battery drain? Glove box light, underhood light, trunk light. All of the above. All of the above are correct. Um, well, we just talked about parasitic drains, right? Technician A says if a starter drive clearance is too small, the starter will produce a noise during cranking. Technician B says if starter drive clearance is too large, the starter will produce a noise after cranking. Neither. Neither one of those guys. That's backwards. That Cadillac that we work on in here, that 71 Cadillac, was... Uh, knocking teeth off the flywheel and it wasn't breaking them off because of the spacing wasn't right. They, whenever the thing would, the starter drive would kick out there, it would hit the tooth and shear it off because it, it never was jumping over the things and so we basically, I took the, uh, the second new flywheel we had to put in that thing, Bobby put a flywheel in it and pulling a transmission out of a 71 Eldorado is not for the faint hearted I can tell you that and he did it twice. But anyway I put that flywheel up there and I hit it with the, uh, I got my high speed cutter at an angle and I, bevy, I beveled every single one of those teeth that was a reverse match for the bevel on the starter gear and then we egged the hole because it wasn't like a normal GM starter. I went over there, got that thing right and it's been doing just fine ever since. And anytime somebody starts talking about taking the starter off that car, I get sort of nervous. So I'm afraid they're going to pull it off and not get it back on their right. we got to put another flywheel in it, you know. And uh, he's not going to hire anybody else to put a flywheel in it but us. Uh, technician A says manufacturers sometimes use metal shims to provide accurate starter drive clearance. That's right. Technician B says hitting the starter may damage the permanent magnets inside. Well that's true but if it's not starting anyway I tap it a little bit. If you hit it hard enough though those ceramic magnets can wind up more than one piece then you've destroyed it so be really careful about hitting one. You know tap it not very hard and kind of gently and all that. Uh, when working with batteries all of the following statements are correct except what? Disconnect the positive terminal first, wear gloves to protect you from battery acids, wear safety glasses, don't smoke around a battery. Mm -hmm. uh, these are all, all except are correct. You got that? That's A. <coughs> now, disconnect the negative terminal first. Now we'll tell you this, it's a strange <coughs> thing. Uh, a lot of the times you'll see negative switches used to ground things because they don't spark as bad. 
if you take a negative terminal bruise, you may see a little spark, but it won't <coughs> be as bad as the one on the positive side. Now, why is a spark bad? Well, if you got one of them stinking uh, batteries that smells like rotten eggs, and you take it off with a little bit of a spark, it can go boom. There are some people running around this country that work on cars that were not paying attention or careful when they were fooling with batteries and had them blow up in their face. And you can get disfigured that way. It's ugly. So make doggone sure you got plenty of protection and you're not making silly ideas. When we solder a battery terminal onto a battery cable on the car, we get the battery out of there and we put it on the bench because you don't want flame over that battery because anything that comes up over there, you know, that, that, I've seen batteries blow up. I've had them blow up on me when I was turning the wrench and it blew up right here and all that stuff hit me in the arm. It stopped it from getting in my face. It was like bad news. Donnie Hughes had one blow up on him and he said he saw, he has a slow motion replay of jagged pieces of plastic going past his face on both. <laughs> and nothing hit him except sprinkles of battery acid, but he could have lost his eyes and everything else. Take that seriously, y'all. Batteries are, can be really, really dangerous. We get comfortable with them because we're there around them every day and oh what, it's just a battery. Uh, if you ever see one blow up, you'll never forget it as long as you live. Especially if it blows up your face. Um, so, you know, eye protection, best, you know, whatever you can do. Um, all right, number five, a battery measures 12.4 volts after removing the surface charge. The battery is charged to what percent? Ding, 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 that's 75. Technician A says the battery must be in good condition and at least 75% charged to accurately test an alternator. Technician B says the alternator output should be tested at idle. Who's right about that? Both. That's actually A. Um, you need your battery good and strong whenever you're making a bunch of tests and everything. You remember part of that parasitic drain thing I gave you was talking about make sure your battery's got a good strong charge on it or you may be on the cusp of voltage won't make modules flake out and do crazy things and you'll think you got a problem you don't have, you know. You gotta have a good strong battery, it's always important. That's why I got that battery on that hand truck over so we can add that if we need to. Um, voltage drop tests are being performed on an alternator positive circuit. The red lead of the multimeter is placed on the alternator output post. Where is the black lead connected? Okay. Generator housing, engine block, battery negative post, battery positive post. If you're doing a voltage drop test and you understand how to do that, you're going to hook it between the alternator positive output post and the positive battery terminal. You're going to always, when you're doing voltage drop, you're always going to be on the same side of the circuit. You're always going to be a positive side if you're doing a positive side voltage drop test, or both of them are going to be on the negative side for the negative side test. Get that down pat. Everybody's talking about voltage drop. Every, every uh, when I go to KC Vision and everywhere else, if you go to an electrical class, everybody's screaming voltage drop. It's all what I'm talking about all the time. It's a scan tool can be used to check cranking voltage, charging voltage, cranking RPM, all of these. All of these? Yeah, you can do all of that stuff. All right, we got pictures on this one here. Now, this is cool. Um, let's see. The reading on this digital voltometer means that the battery is what? Okay. What do you think? Everybody like that. When somebody tell me, low on charge. Well, that'd be more than that. If you're just measuring it, open voltage test, you know, and all that, it's supposed to have more than that. Uh, the voltage, this voltage reading was obtained while cranking the engine. The 816 millivolts is what? See where they're doing the voltage check. See where that meter leads are. Too high. That's a voltage drop. It's too much. On the negative side, the, everything that I've always been taught whenever I was going places and they were teaching this was that you're not allowed to have more than one-tenth of a volt of drop on the negative side. You can have a half a volt on the, on the positive side. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a dirty connection. Um, one time we had this uh, police car come in here that was a uh, Impala. That was an older one, and I don't even know why it wound up in here, but uh, they said they thought something was wrong with the anti-theft on it and they had replaced a battery terminal and this kind of thing. And so Melissa and me were over there working on it when she was here. And I was I did a voltage drop test on, during one of those times when it wouldn't start. And it was dropping seven volts between the, you know, as a side post battery, you know, that seven volts between that post and the battery, seven volts being gone. It wasn't, it wouldn't even spin a starter. And they were assuming, because you've seen so many GM cars with uh, anti-theft issues and that's what it was. Well, the battery, the side battery post, you know, uses this plastic, Part. It looked pretty good when I took it off. They, well, they had put a battery in it. They didn't put a battery cable. They put a battery in it. When I took that thing off, that, that cable was all chalked up in there. You couldn't see it. And we replaced that, put a new battery cable on it, and they've never had a problem with it since then. It cost about $15 to fix it. Uh, 
Uh, but, I mean, why they brought it here, I'm not sure. I mean, why are we working on a state trooper car? I mean, it's an old car. It's kind of a sleeper, you know, an old 2001 Malibu or whatever it was. But um, not Malibu, it was an Impala, I'm sorry. Um, what test is being performed in this uh, situation here? Look at the picture and tell me what test is being done in this thing. Everybody, everybody, somebody talk to me. Starter amperage draw test sound right? Why? You got an amp probe around the negative cable with the arrow pointing away from the battery. Of course, it, you can't see that in this illustration. But that is a starter amperage draw test. You know, whoa, 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 whoa. What do you expect when you're going to start a starter amperage draw test? What's normal? I'm looking for 175 to 220, something like that. Amps, spinning it over. Starter amperage draw. What test is being performed in this illustration? Here's a nice little picture again. We got a picture. What's that? What are they doing in that situation? Is that an alternator output voltage drop test, alternator ground circuit test, battery voltage test, charging current test? Drop test. That is the voltage drop test. You notice they're hooked up to the positive battery terminal and with a negative lead. And the most positive part of the circuit is where you're going to put your probe. If you hook the probes up backwards, the meter just reads minus. That is not the end of the world. So, a battery high rate discharge load capacity test is being performed on a 12 volt battery. Technician A says a good battery should have a voltage reading at higher than 9.6 volts under load at the end of the 15 second test. And that's the magic number. Um, technician B says the battery should be discharged at twice its cold cranking amp rating. The only person that's right there is A because you're doing it to half the cold cranking amps. If the cold cranking amps is 500, you're going to do it to 250 for 15 seconds, it should stay above 9.6 volts. And that's what that carbon pile knob is for on that snap-on tester we got out there. Uh, number 14, normal battery drain, which would be parasitic drain with a vehicle with many computer and electronic circuits, is 20 to 30 milliamps. It should not be over 50, because if it's over 50, you're going to be killing batteries and things. Imagine that being a little leak in a bucket. If you leave it, let it leak long enough, it's going to go dark. You know, go, go dry. Number 15, technician A says a discharged battery, which would be lower than, more, more, lower than normal battery voltage, can cause solenoid clicking. Eh, brr, brr, you never done that? Technician B says a discharged battery or dirty corroded battery terminals can cause solenoid clicking. Brr, 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 brr. Yeah, both those guys are right. Uh, or, uh, actually, um, well, I don't really like the fact that they're not telling me the truth about that. Uh, I would say both of those can cause it. You know what I mean? If it's low enough, lower than normal battery voltage, like if it's like got like eight volts in it or something, you're going to hear the solenoid clicking. The answer key claims that B is the only one that's right, and I think that's that's a yo-yo deal there. So I'm going to say both of those guys are right. Slow cranking can be caused by all of the following except what? Ding, 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 ding. Slow cranking. Think about it. Read the read the answers. Lower discharge battery. Mm -hmm. A B is the one that cannot cause slow cranking. It's open neutral safety switch just keeps it from doing anything. I said D. B. Oh, you said D. If the starter run turns slowly when engaged, possible cause would be what? A Warner defective starter. Not an open ignition switch, not a defective solenoid, although I don't like that either because if you've got voltage drop inside that solenoid where it's provided voltage, that battery voltage to the starter motor, you may have that issue there, right? A disconnected battery cable is not going to cause it, but if the starter can turn slowly because of B or D, but they're wanting you to put D. Uh, an acceptable charge and circuit voltage on a 12 volt system is what? 13. 13 to 15. Now, if it goes much over 15, like if there's something wrong with it, it can blow the halogen bulbs and stuff on there, you know, because they can't handle over about 15.6 volts usually. Technician A says a voltage drop test of the charging circuit should only be performed when current's flowing through the circuit. Technician B says to measure the voltage drop of a charging system, connect the leads of the voltmeter to the positive and negative terminals of the battery. A. Who's right about that? That's A only. Um, there was uh, a. Uh, come on in here, Cobb. Don't come on in here then. <laughs> he got here five minutes. Come on, come on, come on. Come on in here where it's cool. I know you should stay there. I'm almost through. What's up? What's up? I know, and we're close, and we're almost done here. Where are we going? We're, it's a, we're on our way to docks in a minute. Um, but I had a, uh, this one car one time that had a feedback carburetor uh, electronic engine control system, and it got struck by lightning, uh, and it vaporized the radio antenna. 
there was molecular spray from the radio antenna, antenna all over the, and uh, it did not damage the radio, but it destroyed the engine controller. Antenna strikes, you know, get struck by lightning, it doesn't hurt the radio, get the, go figure. But the engine controller was dead as a, you know, doornail. All right, we're almost through, let's go down here. Uh, okay. All right, uh, alternator could, uh, let me see, where am I at here? 20. The te testing the electrical system through the ladder plug using a digital meter can test what? Charging system voltage, believe it or not, you can test it that way. Alternator could test as producing lower than normal output, yet still be okay if what? Any of the above. Drive belt slipping, battery's weak or defective, engine speed's not turned out high after you're tested. If you can grab the fan on an alternator and turn it and slip the belt, then that belt's too loose. If you can get to the fan, a lot of them you can't even see the fan anymore. Cold cranking amps refers to the current a battery can produce while sustaining 7.2 volts at what temperature? Yeah, zero, believe it or not, zero degrees. Reserve capacity is the number of minutes a battery can produce blank amps while maintaining at least 10.5 volts. 25, 25 amps. When producing a battery load test, how many seconds should the load be applied? Charlie, uh, that's 15. And finally, what type of battery testing uses an electronic device to measure a battery state of charging capacity? That would be conductance testing, like that big fancy tool we got out there. Everybody, all right, you guys shut down the shop. And